Good morning, and welcome to day two of Microsoft Build. Today, <laughs> yeah. Yay. from an 8.30 crowd. That's, yeah, that's a lot of that's energy, awesome. good job. <laughs> Today, we have two goals of what we want you to get out of this session. One is we hope you're empowered to build beautiful user experiences in any Windows application. And secondly, we want to empower you to help influence the Windows presentation platform and our direction over the next year. Hi. I'm Lindsay, and I'm a program manager on the composition team within Windows. I've been working on low-level rendering and animation APIs for the past few years. And I'm Joe Stegman. I wear uh, two hats in the Windows team. I uh, run the accessibility platform and tools team, the program management team, and then I run the program management team for the XAML UI platform. And welcome. And today we're going to do State of the Union. Lindsay, have you? You done one of those before? Uh, not exactly. You, My uh, political career hasn't taken me quite that yeah, far. I, I don't, don't really know what one is, but true story, but not that you care. So about three months ago, uh, we were doing build planning, and we kind of agree in principle on doing a session about the presentation platform. What's new in the Windows 10 presentation platform? So you know, you write it on a post-it post -it note. You have like a working title about some session turn it into the build machinery and they crank it and then we go away and occasionally we get an update that says, by the way, you're doing a session. No big deal, fast forward about three weeks ago, Lindsay comes off vacation. We sit down, we say, let's start working on our session. We open up our PowerPoint template. We go to put the title in. Hey, what's the title? State, State of the Union. Lindsay, you done one of those before? No, I don't, I don't know what that is. I, I, don't know what, I don't know what that is. But it's probably the new hotness. It's probably what everybody used to call roadmap is now State of the Union, or overview is now State of the Union. So I go, ah, true story, I searched all the build session titles for roadmap, 17. Overview, 18. What's new? Over 100. True story, go look. State of the Union, how many? One. One. What's with that? Like, what are people going to expect? It's, it's a, how, what'd you call the title? Uh, maybe a little bit pretentious. Pretentious, yeah. So anyway, I thought, well, maybe it just hasn't taken on here yet, but it's really popular in other conferences. Just wanted to feel good about our title. So I looked. The latest conference that I knew about was F8. I went and looked. How many State of the Union sessions there? Zero. So like, I think we're breaking new ground, but we're really not trying to break new ground. So we thought we'd start out by just being really good about framing our State of the Union, which is really effectively just a roadmap for the presentation platform. But there's really two things we're trying to cover at a high level. One is that we've been talking to customers, internal partners, external partners over the last year, year and a half to get feedback on what they'd like to see in the platform. And we've done some of that. We've done some of it in the release of Windows we just did, which is what we call 1903 or the spring update. And 1903, Three again, how, how does that work? Yeah, so um, even inside Microsoft, we're not always experts on the uh, build release numbers. And in this talk, we're actually gonna reference a whole bunch of different releases of the operating system. So one trick to kind of keep track of what build we're talking about is that the first two numbers indicate the year the build was released. So 19, 2019, 18, 2018. And the second two numbers give you an idea of the month we locked the build down. So that would be spring versus fall. So 1903 is the May update that you guys are getting right now. So we're, we'll talk about uh, some of the feedback that we received and what we're doing about that in the 1903 update. We also have, uh, how many people are familiar with WinUI? So for people right. not familiar with, hey, oh, uh, hey, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, he's familiar with it. Um, so for people not familiar with WinUI, what we've done based on feedback is we've taken our new controls that used to ship inbox with, with Windows 10, and we've lifted them out of, the, out of Windows and made them work on in-market versions of Windows to make it easier for developers to be able to adopt those. So we'll talk about some work that we've done in WinUI this year, as well as our planned work in both the platform, inbox Windows, and WinUI for later this year. So that's one aspect of what we'll be doing and then the other aspect is we'll just continue to solicit feedback from you to help us refine both the things that we're working on later this year. And one way you can do that is that we'll be, there's a WinUI booth. We'll be at the WinUI booth as well as all our cohorts and coworkers will be there. Come by and give us feedback on things that you've seen here today, as well as uh, Lindsay will be talking about 
WinUI, which uh, is our controls library that we'll talk about what we're doing to expand that. But all the work we're doing in WinUI is open and in the public, and we, you can come contribute there in terms of helping us prioritize as well as giving us feedback on individual features. So since it's 8.30 a.m., we figured we'd start with a little bit of audience participation to wake you all up. Um, don't worry, it's not that hard. You just have to raise your hand. So the question is, how do you develop? It's Microsoft Build, after all, so we're guessing these are pretty familiar to most people in the room. But who here has ever worked with UWP XAML? All right. How about WPF? WinForms? Woo! <laughs> So that's great, and we have a lot of really great Windows-first technologies out there. But we know a lot of you are starting to care more about cross-platform endpoints, iOS, Android. And so we've also been putting a lot of energy within Microsoft into making Xamarin great. Who here has ever used Xamarin? Yeah, gives you an opportunity to reuse your .NET backend, but still get a native look and feel app on all of these different platforms, including Windows. But a lot of you may have seen the announcement yesterday that we're also looking into React and React Native. Who here spends any of their time writing web code? Ah, a few of you. So basically, we also want to enable developers who spend most of their time authoring code in JavaScript to build native feeling Windows applications. And today, we want to touch a bit on things we're doing to enable all Windows applications to look great. So basically, regardless of your technology stack, we want to talk about how you'll be able to efficiently build beautiful, intuitive, and consistent user experiences for your customers. And with that, Joe will talk a little bit about the presentation platform. We're going to have to work on our... <laughs> we, uh, we rehearsed a couple times, but we never had a machine way over on the right here that we had to dance around. Anyway, uh, Windows presentation platform. So some of you may be wondering exactly what is that? What's the scope of what we might be talking about today related to that? So at a high level, the Windows presentation platform, you can think of it as the technologies we at Microsoft have built to allow you to build user interfaces for your applications. And one of the common ways to do that is using something like Windows Forms or WPF. And these are Win32 based systems. They're built on fundamentally on HWINs. In Windows 10, we invested in a new uh, layered stack a composition system, an animation system that we'll sometimes call the visual layer as well as a Windows 10 XAML stack that sits on top of that, a controls and framework. And that whole thing is, you may hear us refer to it as the like UWP presentation stack or the Windows 10 presentation stack. And so we'll be spending some cycles there today. And then I mentioned before WinUI, which is our controls library that we layer on top of our Windows 10 presentation stack. So those are the main pieces that we think of in general with uh, the Windows presentation platform, plus, if you were here last year and heard us talk about XAML Islands, or if you saw the keynote yesterday, Kevin Gallo talked about XAML Islands, that's our technology that allows you to take UWP content and host it in your Win32 app. And we'll be talking today mostly about those three items. So with that. So Joe's mentioned a little bit already about WinUI and moving out of box. But we wanted to talk a bit about why we did that and what benefits it brings to you. So you are here kind of where the arrow is, WinUI controls, above the dotted line and out of the inbox version of Windows. But what does that really buy you? Well, one of the big drivers for this was better reach for your UI improvements. Part of this is because we can support this on all in-market versions of Windows 10. So for those of you who have maybe worked with Microsoft before, Maybe six months ago, you reach out to us about a problem you're having, something we can build in the platform to make your life easier. Great, we talk about it, we decide that's a great feature, we should totally add it, and we get to work. And because we had this conversation six months ago, it's in the 1903 release of Windows that you now have access to. Great, successful partnership, right? Kind of, except that now your customer has to update to 1903 in order to actually see those improvements. So any of your customers that are on versions of Windows from 2017 or 2018 aren't going to see those improvements quite yet. And this is maybe OK for some apps, but especially for enterprises who stay on a particular version of the operating system sometimes for years at a time, it takes you a really long time to see the benefit of all that work of this improvement that we've put time into and you've put time into. So with WinUI, we thought we could do better. 
By decoupling the controls from the actual operating system in the platform, we can make these controls work down level to earlier versions of Windows. And now, when you make that UI improvement, your customer can be running any of these versions of the operating system and see that uh, improved user experience that you've built. So you no longer have to worry about the SDK fragmentation and the different versions of Windows with different controls supported in different places. And for the same amount of investment on your end, you get a higher return on that investment because a larger percentage of your customer base can see that UX improvement sooner. Another piece of feedback we got um, that we wanted to really embrace with WinUI was that we'd like a bit more transparency into our engineering process, what we're working on, and what's on the roadmap. So with WinUI, everything is being engineered in the open. I have the link here if anyone wants to check it out, but it takes you to this GitHub page. All of the controls live here, and they're open sourced. This means that you can check out the source code for any of these, and also that you're empowered to contribute and make any additions or um, kind of bug fixes or understand the code better, any of these things. There's also a public backlog of the features that we're working on that are in progress and things that are on the longer term back burner. You also have the opportunity to open issues directly and engage with people on the team, both the program managers and developers working on these controls. This means that if you have a bug, you can file it right here and have direct engagement. If you have a feature proposal, you can propose it here and have a back and forth design discussion with someone inside the company working on that feature. Here's one thread I kind of captured here because I thought it was particularly cool. Um, it's a proposal for a new grid and you can see there's been a really rich back and forth discussion about what needs to be built and kind of a proposal from inside as well as feedback from outside on what the control needs to be capable of. And I just thought it was a really good example of sort of this co-engineering that we're trying to embrace from inside and outside the company. So those are two of the kind of big driving reasons for why we did this. But there are a lot of benefits for you in terms of using WinUI. One is that it's really the best of the platform. You're getting the same high quality implementation of all the controls that you have in box today. They're just packaged in a new location. In addition, all of the new controls that are being added to WinUI are being held to the same quality bar as everything we've been building internally for years. It's also the best place to get the most up-to-date, fluent controls and styles. As we're making additions to the control library, those will be the best new controls that are really embracing the fluent design system. It's also where any tweaks to things like acrylic or reveal or any of the existing concepts are gonna happen. So it really is the best place to get the most up-to-date UI. So let me get this straight. Those crazy people in Windows take the controls, they implement them once, and they actually copy them to two places. One is WinUI, and one is in the platform? Well, <laughs> sort of. Over time, we're really trying to move to doing all of our development in WinUI, so that that's where you get the latest and greatest. For now, the inbox controls are still supporting the same functionality, but over time, WinUI is really the future of where you'll consume any new control. Awesome. In addition, WinUI is really about embracing easy adoption. We already talked a bit about how the down-level support to in-market versions of Windows enable you to not worry as much about SDK fragmentation and things like that. But it's also delivered via NuGet every four months. This means that in order to rev your app to adopt any of these new controls, you get to just simply update the NuGet package. You don't need to update your dev box to a new version of Windows if you don't want to, and you don't need to move the target SDK of your application forward if you don't want to. It's all on you and when you want to update, when you want to adopt these new controls or UI features. Also, in order to make this change, all you have to do is make a namespace update from the more scoped inbox version of Windows UI XAML into the more broad Microsoft UI XAML, which is where all of the WinUI controls live. So minimal code change with a lot of benefit to you in terms of the down-level support. In addition, all of these new controls are gonna be part of Visual Studio and you'll have the same integration and workflow that you expect today. Lastly, we talked a little bit about open and agile development already, um, but one addition to that is that there's also preview versions of WinUI that you can use with in progress um, APIs and controls that we're working on. So not only do you have the stable version that releases every four months and enables you to take a dependency on really well vetted and locked in kind of controls, 
but you also can check out things that are in progress and provide feedback with a really fast um, feedback loop. So this is all great, and you know, we've made a lot of improvements to the workflow of using and consuming all of these controls. But as we've really gotten into the process of WinUI, we think that more than controls are really necessary to make this entire effort really um, empower you to build great user experiences. So Joe will talk a bit about moving beyond controls. So uh, where we are today is that you, if you're building a Windows 10 application, an application targeted for Windows 10, you can target the RS2 version, which is like 1703, I think, version of Windows. You can target that, and just all you have to do is have your uh, partners, customers deploying RS2 and above, and you can now get control updates based on WinUI that'll run on that version. So all our new controls will run there. So you don't have to require your customers or partners to upgrade. And that's great and it works super well for controls and all our development is out in the open so you can participate in us prioritizing work in that space. So that's at the controls layer. I'm gonna jump down a little bit and talk about some things that we still ship inbox to Windows that we haven't decoupled and therefore you can only get access to them in the latest version of Windows. Um, and you may be asking, like, what are the kinds of things, though, that can't be shipped as controls on top of the platform? And one example is input validation. This is a request that we've had in the platform for quite some time, and we want to do in the platform. In fact, we're actively working on doing input validation in the platform. The problem is, is that uh, input validation requires changes to our data binding engine, to our XAML compiler, and actually fundamentally to all of our controls. And we can't easily lift that out into WinUI, yet we've heard from, our, from people using Windows 10 XAML that they've told us that, hey, I really can't depend on updates that you're doing that require me to update the OS because I just can't do that. That's too difficult. So that's two things. One is that uh, you as partners can't use it, and two, we can't get the feedback from you on those features because you're just not easily able to consume it. So, so what do we do? So one thing is it's not just input validation. That's one important thing, but there are many things in this space. XAML Islands, which we'll talk a little bit more about, but was demoed yesterday. Uh, that's another thing that depends on lots of fundamental pieces in the platform that are not controls, that we can't ship outside, out of box, if you will. Other things like windowing ship here too. So we realize though we, we want everybody to be able to consume those in a way that makes the most sense for them, and we wanna be able to get feedback on them, and we wanna be on a journey of co-developing these with, with uh, external developers, so how do we do that? So we've been stepping back and trying to think about, you know, what's a different way that we could attack this problem? And we've been sort of starting from the top and working from, from the top down, from controls, because those are easier, especially new controls are easier to sort of decouple and layer cleanly on top of the platform. But, you know, as we started thinking about it, what if, we just took the whole platform, that included the composition system, the controls, the framework, everything, we took that out of Windows, we rewired it to work on 1703 and above, which is RS2 and above, but the whole thing, rewired it to work on earlier versions of Windows 10, made that available as a NuGet package, and then allowed you to use that just like WinUI today. And so we think of that whole concept of decoupling the whole presentation platform, we think of that whole thing as WinUI 3.0. It's just the next evolution of WinUI. And with WinUI 3.0, what effectively you get is the future of the presentation platform, which is not just controls available out of Windows and updated out of Windows, but you get the whole composition system, the animation system, the controls, and the framework all available as a NuGet package that you can use side by side on previous versions of Windows 10 up to right now 1703 and above, which is RS2 and above. This works the same way as WinUI does today, NuGet package, side by side. You do have to move, just like with WinUI today, you have to move to a new namespace. We uh, currently, uh, we have open development and open source uh, for our controls to bring the whole stack is gonna require a little bit more work to get that all compiling and developed in the open. And so we're committed to that, it just will take a little bit more time. And so for the first round, we won't have the whole thing open sourced. All of our tooling, 
all of our template studio, all of that is gonna move to WinUI 3.0. So this will be the future of the presentation platform. In fact, our current stuff that we have inbox will still service that, but effectively we're not gonna be updating that. We'll just be updating the new presentation platform, the WinUI 3.0 version of the presentation platform. So you might be asking, when are you, when are you gonna have this available? I'm gonna show you a demo, an early demo of WinUI 3.0 now, actually we're, we're, we have a couple demos on it, but our goal is to have a preview of this out at the end of this year that you'll be able to, to try out. So this is the thing that by far and away we're most excited about with the presentation platform is now being able to take a much larger part of that and making it available uh, outside of Windows. So for the demo, I have to do some demo setup for the demo because I'm gonna be demoing input validation which is a new feature. So I mentioned we're working on it. It has some changes that, that are lower in the stack. And so I did wanna at least explain a little bit about input validation and the work we're doing there uh, for demo purposes. So for input validation that we're actively working on, there's really two pieces. There is a uh, presentation, a error state visual for all our controls. So we basically added these error state visuals, which you see here, which are backed by templates so you as a developer can configure the error state and you as a developer effectively just set a control into an error state and it'll automatically pop the visual here and you can give it a list of error messages and those will display in a little tool tip. So one aspect is updating all the controls for this error state. The other aspect is how many people are familiar with I notify data error info? Uh, a few, because it's an oldie but goodie. It's nearly as old as me. Uh, I worked on Windows Forms, and this was, a, this was a big hitter back in the Windows Forms days. So what we're doing is we're also supporting I notify data error info in UWP, and we're teaching our data binding engine to understand I notify data error info. And so what this means is if you support that interface on your data model, you can now indicate that your data model is in an error state. You can indicate what properties in your data model are in an error state and there's an event called error changed, which you would fire to indicate when your data model goes in and out of an error state. So if, you ha if your data model is in an error state, there's a property in an error state, you'd set has errors, and then in get errors, you would return the property that's in the error state. So that's just a little background because I'll be showing that a little bit as we move over to the demo machine eight, I think. <laughs> So this is uh, Winver running. So this is 1803, so 2000, it's a year ago, spring uh, 2018 update, RS4 maybe. And over on the right, you can see this Microsoft.UI.xaml. That is our, and sorry it's small, that is WinUI 3.0. So we've basically taken the whole presentation platform from 1903, our latest version, added input validation, taken that out, made it available in a NuGet package, and now I've installed that whole thing on uh, 1803 box. And that's what you see here, and that's what this demo is running. So for this demo, the namespaces were all changed from, Microsoft, or from Windows to Microsoft.UI. And let me run the demo here real quick, which it's, the demo is pretty simple. It's just a form with validation in it, and just to be clear here, this is no additional updates to the 1803 box itself. All of the changes you're talking about are just to the application code, right? That's correct, the application code, and I installed the NuGet package of WinUI 3.0 effectively. So the form is a pretty basic form, and it's a US zip code down here. So today, I could enter letters for the US zip code, which I just wanna be able to keep that just as numbers, and so this seems like a great use of input validation. So here is the markup for this, and it's a text box, and it's bound to a view model, two-way bound to a view model using compiled bindings, and the view model it's bound to is zip, or the property it's bound to is zip. So I'm gonna go over into the view model, and this is the view model, and you can see it's now supporting I notify data error info, and the zip property, is here, and right now it does what you would expect for a view model or data model is it looks, anytime zip is set, it looks to see if it's a new version of a new zip, 
And if it is, it sets the value and fires notify property change. So what I want to do now is I want to um, call some code that I previously wrote because you don't want to watch me type. But what I'm doing now is I'll just go ahead and validate the US zip code, which is this code here. And all it does is it just checks to see, is it a number? And if it, first of all, it's a, a letter, which is for US zip code, we don't want a letter. If it's a letter, it just puts it in an error state, sets using iData error info, I notify data error info, sets an error code on the property, and fires the data errors, um, or the errors changed event on I notify data error info. That's it, effectively, and now we'll rerun. So all I did is add that validation that talks to I notify data error info, and now our data biting engine will notice, it'll, it'll be uh, paying attention to I notify data error info, automatically detect that there's an error on the property, and go ahead and uh, put the control in an error state. So I'll type a uh, number, fine, and let's just see. And there we go, letters, and you get the error state that I set in the view model, and we'll back up, and you'll see the error goes away. So there you saw two features in one, WinUI 3.0, as well as the uh, input validation work that we've done in WinUI 3.0 and in the platform. Cool. So that was a great demo of input validation working on a build before the core OS functionality that would have supported that feature. But another area where we've seen this type of need as we've lifted some of the controls out of box is around some of the lower level composition capabilities like animation and rendering. Those of you who came to build last year may remember that we announced support for something called Lottie for Windows. This is a low level, or sorry, a vector graphics animation kind of community where you can take After Effects files and support them directly as native primitives on platforms like iOS and Android. As of last year at Build, this also became possible on Windows. So this was really cool because it filled a need that a lot of developers had reached out to us about. The fact that even teams inside Microsoft, like the OneNote team, had been inserting these types of animations to improve engagement in their application. And they could only make those updates on their iOS and Android apps. We added support for Windows, and it was great. Except that when we went back and talked to a lot of these customers, and they found out that they could only use it on builds of uh, Windows starting with RS5, which was last year's fall builds, 1809, um, it became less appealing to them. They wanted to wait until more of their user base had moved on to those newer versions of Windows before really considering adopting this feature. So even though we added a new control called the animated visual player that let you play these scenes, there was a dependency on shape visuals and path animations and some of these core capabilities inside the operating system that prevented this control from being usable on lower level versions of Windows. Well, at least until now. Um, so with that, we wanna show a demo of Lottie animations working on RS4 as well. So this is the same NuGet package lifted up on your machine. Can you hit machine six? Please? Six, got it. Yes, so this is, again, an example of a decoupled presentation platform. So here, you can see I'm also running version 1803. Small, I know, sorry. Um, so this is a version of Windows from last spring, which is before some of those core capabilities were available in the operating system. But here, where I have this little sample, and if I click through and try and connect to uh, the Wi-Fi, you can see that it rejects me with this nice little animation. This is a pretty simple use case, but in general, um, the point here is that it's actually possible on an older release of Windows. So all of these primitives for composition and animation, some of the things like effects or lighting or all of those capabilities as well, will all be available on lower level versions of the operating system than where they originally shipped. In this case, Lottie's a cool example because it happens to be something we built pretty recently and where we have a real need to run it down level. This particular UX um, would have been achievable in the past only by using GIFs of a bunch of different resolutions or a static image. So you can go back to number five. five. And we're on to, so, so uh, just to summarize sort of our, our previous section. So what we showed is that we've taken basically the capabilities up until 1903, so the latest presentation capabilities that are shipping in Windows. We've extracted the whole composition, animation, and controls layer out of that, and now we've made that available on 
in market versions of Windows 10, so up from uh, 1703 plus. So now you as a developer can take advantage of these new features like the Lottie capabilities that previously were only available on the latest versions of Windows 10 and use them now in your apps all the way back to uh, RS2 again, which is 17, 1703, I believe. So switching gears a little bit, uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, XAML Islands. Uh, XAML Islands is currently something that depends on inbox version of Windows 1903. This was something we announced uh, last year at uh, Build as a preview, and we shipped the V1 in Windows 1903. So the first question you might be wondering, first of all, how many people have tried XAML Islands out? A few? How many people have never heard of XAML Islands? So for, uh, just to reiterate, for those that are new to XAML Islands, this is uh, the thing that allows you to leverage our UWP Windows 10 presentation capabilities, like the stuff that uh, Lindsay just demoed, to be able to leverage those in your existing Win32 application. We know that a lot of developers have really large existing Win32 code bases, and we know that nobody wants to rewrite anything. Um, but they still may want to take advantage of the new things that we're doing in Windows 10. So how can you take advantage of those new uh, capabilities without having to rewrite your applications? And that's what, where XAML Islands comes in. We really just want, from a presentation perspective, you as a developer to be able to mix and match the technologies and not have to worry about it's A or B. It's just a Windows app, and you can use either one of them and mix and match them. And XAML Islands is our technique to allow you to do that. Um, so. Right now, XAML Island ships inbox with Windows, but the first thing I want to mention is that our goal with XAML Islands is to include XAML Islands with our WinUI 3.0, which means it'll also, the technology to enable XAML Islands will be lifted out of the platform, be available in a NuGet package so that you can now use it or will be able to use it on previous versions of Windows 10 as well. So two other things that I want to mention about XAML Islands. If you've tried to use it today, you may have noticed that there's some problems with if you're trying to use a C-sharp UWP control in a WPF or Windows Forms application. And the reason for that is that the version of .NET that WPF and Windows Forms uses, the .NET framework, is different than the version of .NET that UWP uses. And with uh, WPF and Windows Forms moving to .NET Core 3, now the .NET versions are much more similar, and because they're similar, we'll be able to, uh, you'll have better experiences in having your UWP C-sharp custom controls working in your WPF or Windows Forms .NET Core 3 application. And Lindsay will show a demo of that. So one is we've made improvements to that. The other one that is something that um, we don't necessarily highlight or mention a lot, which is that, uh, Today, there are lots of people who have uh, just C++ code bases. Is anybody out there consider themselves a C++ developer? Yes, awesome. So uh, we at Microsoft have uh, a lot of teams that are C++ teams. The Office apps, a lot of those are just C++ apps. And as a C++ developer, a lot of times, you want to make sure your app stays only C++ for, for, for performance reasons and for working set reasons. You want to keep it C++. Well, uh, with WPF and Windows Forms, if a C++ developer wanted to take advantage of those, since those are written in C Sharp, they couldn't do that and still stay a C++ application. So a lot of them didn't do that. Well, the, the UWP uh, presentation stack, the new XAML stack and the composition system, those are written entirely in C++ with, if you will, C Sharp bindings. But they are fully native C++. Our controls are native C++ controls and the whole stack is actually a C++ stack. So if you have a C++ code base and you were looking for ways to modernize or uh, your UX or take advantage of some of the new improvements we've done in the UX, you know, touch, um, uh, uh, the uh, ink stuff that we've done, um, the fluent design, connected animations, you can now do that in your application by using XAML Islands and UWP and still keep it a C++ application. So with that, I'll turn it over to Lindsay for a couple demos. Seven. seven, number seven. So one of the pieces of feedback that has been pretty prevalent um, around the preview release of XAML Islands that was announced last year at Build 
is that we needed to work on the actual workflow, the getting started of putting XAML islands inside your application. So here, I'm running Visual Studio 2019 with a preview version of .NET Core 3.0. So a lot of the improvements that I'm talking about work together with that um, setup. Here, there's a WinForms application, as you can see, and it has a UWP project inside it as well. So the first thing I wanted to point out is that actually getting these two things inside the same solution file and having the right reference between them was much easier than before. Now, integrated with Visual Studio, you'll be able to link these references the same way you would with two UWP projects living in the same solution. Seems like a minor thing, but before this was a really manual process and wasn't able to actually just be a click of this uh, dialogue that you're used to. Another update that we wanted to call out is the update to the actual XAML host control itself. Those of you that have tried XAML Islands today may have experienced a lot of manual processes, such as copy pasting WinMD files and linking them through Visual Studio. Now, we've made that workflow simpler by integrating all of this in an updated version of the Windows Community Toolkit version of these controls. So if I look at my NuGet references here, I have this uh, XAML host control. This is included in the Windows Community Toolkit 6.0 preview and takes care of a lot of the actual setup and linking of various file types to get going with Windows, uh, with XAML Islands. Once you have this included, you can simply include that control using the Visual Studio Designer and get your automatically generated code the same way as you'll see when I run this app, I have some WinForms radio buttons as well as my XAML host control. Then you just point to the reference entry point, which in my case is my UWP library, and you're good to go on getting started with XAML Islands. So one last thing to call out before I run this app is I've included a custom control here, this name reporter, which is authored in C++, or sorry, C Sharp and XAML. As Joe mentioned previously, including custom controls that were authored with managed code wasn't really possible with XAML Islands due to some of the mismatch between UWP and WPF or Windows Forms. So now when I run this application, kind of a little demo app here. When this launches, you'll see I have some Windows Forms UI on the left-hand side with my buttons, and on the right, I have a large XAML island with this top navigation, which is all built in um, UWP XAML, and all of the controls. So this is kind of a demo to show a lot of different controls working here. So my custom user control here, the name box that I mentioned earlier, and this is the code that backs it, just kind of for reference. It is actually managed code. And the other thing that we've done with XAML Islands to make them a little easier to use and a better experience for you is we fixed a lot of the rough edges that you may have experienced with some of the controls previously. For example, acrylic and reveal are now working inside XAML Islands. And some of the airspace issues that you were hitting with flyouts and content dialogues are fixed as well. So we're hoping with these improvements, XAML Islands become easier for you to use and a better experience for your end user once you've embedded them in your application. So this is all cool, and it's a great little demo app to show you a bunch of controls working inside XAML Islands, but I wanted to talk about another use case for this technology as well. One piece of feedback we've gotten is that sometimes it's not about modernizing or updating your UI, but it's also about creating modern content. Inside the Windows 10 stack, we've been putting a lot of investment into um, creating a 3D, Windows 3D, which is a lightweight 3D rendering and scene management API. This allows you to create 3D scenes or 3D objects in your UWP application. But with XAML Islands, you can also do this in your WinForms, WPF, or frameworkless application. So we want to show a demo of that as well. Next, there we go. Nice. Nope, yeah. not switching. Nope, not switching. So here we've taken a piece of 3D content. We can imagine this is an app that, say, an enterprise worker like uh, on an assembly line or in the field is using and comparing this part schematic with a physical part that they're seeing in the field. And here, you know, looks like a static image, right? You could take a picture of something like this, have a labeled schematic, great. But where you get the value of having a real 3D model is you can manipulate it and see different angles. In this case, because my 3D and 2D content are integrated, all of my labels stay in the same place, and I'm able to actually look at all of the part in detail. This is all tied to the same composition animation system as your 2D UI, 
So you can hook up things like a manipulation or a zoom animation to be able to hone in on specific parts and make this a fully integrated 3D experience in your application. Beyond that, it being lightweight and easy for you to consume, this is just a GLTF asset that's been loaded inside my um, application. So it's as simple as loading an image. Furthermore, a lot of these assets are pretty actually easy to create or things that your company may already have on hand. You can load something that's been created in you know, Paint 3D, or you can load something that was created in AutoCAD and converted to GLTF. So for companies that are actually doing these types of manufacturing, they may often have these assets on hand already, and now you can easily load them in your application to get much more modernized, kind of integrated real experiences and represent real 3D objects or scenes in your 2D app. So Lindsay, you took a WPF application, which is the shell, and you hosted some of our new tech only available on the Windows 10 presentation platform in that middle part to get this really nice 3D experience. Exactly, so just this part with the actual 3D object and these labels are from the UWP stack. All of the rest of this code that houses, in fact, this is actually based on a 2011 WPF sample from MSDN, and <laughs> this island was inserted inside that. So this is really about bringing um, modern content and new experiences to an existing application. Back to React Native for Windows. How, how many people saw the M365 keynote yesterday? Some, in there, in that keynote, there was a demo for React Native for Windows. And some people may be wondering, what is this? Why are you talking about, why, are, why is this valuable to me or why would it be valuable to me? And why are you talking about React Native for Windows in a Windows presentation platform talk? So all good questions. So stepping back for a minute and just looking at Windows, if you're a Windows developer, you only target Windows, you only care about Windows, then you're probably just using Windows presentation platform APIs and you're fine, you're happy, you're good to go. But if you're not, and we know a lot of developers don't, they, they have to worry about other platforms. They have to worry about iOS, they have to worry about Android, they have to worry about maybe Mac OS or Linux and they need to be efficient in getting the application they're working on, working on these other endpoints as well. And by efficient, I mean not dual authoring. You don't want to author it one time for each platform. You'd like to do something that's more efficient than that. So there are a couple options. For one option is you could write a browser-based app, and a lot of people do that, but if you're a desktop developer and you're used to unfettered access to the system, or if you need a really great experience on mobile, sometimes that breaks down. So instead, what some developers do is they use an abstraction layer, and one of those is, sorry, getting the slides caught up. There we go. One of the things that you can do is target something like Xamarin, and Xamarin and Xamarin Forms just provides a consistent API on top of all the platforms so that you as a developer can efficiently build your app or share assets by uh, using programming to a common API and then sharing the assets you're building across all these different platforms. The nice thing about things like Xamarin and Xamarin Forms is it's just thinly layered on top of the native platform. So if you use a Xamarin Forms button, behind the scenes when you're running that on Windows, it's just a Windows button, and on iOS, it's just an iOS button. So you're getting the native fidelity of the platform. So Xamarin and Xamarin Forms work great for developers who are .NET developers and C-sharp developers, which we recognize that most people in this room are likely that. There's a, another set of developers that are used to ha that are uh, familiar with web technologies. And what uh, Facebook did a few years ago is they created something called React and then uh, another version called React Native. And React Native is analogous to kind of what Xamarin Forms is, only React Native, rather than using C Sharp and .NET, it uses JavaScript, CSS, and it has a markup format called JSX, but it basically uses web technologies to do the same thing, to provide an abstraction over all the native platforms. Now, um, what we'd had feedback on the Windows side that it would be great if there was a, a React Native version that worked great for Windows, and it turns out there wasn't one. So we've been partnering with Facebook and teams inside of Microsoft and outside of Microsoft to build a really great version of React Native for Windows. And you may say, oh, okay, so you've done that. Is, who, who would actually use that? We, we get that people may want to use it, but are people actually using it? And it turns out one of the main reasons we did it is because we here at Microsoft 
are making significant investments in React Native. And you may ask, why is that? And we'll, let's take an example of, uh, I'd mentioned that uh, Office apps are all native apps today. Um, and in fact, like Word, they have a version of Word that is a native C++ app on Windows and a native version on iOS and a native version on Android. And they have a web version and they have a Mac version. And these are actually, they are all started out as different code bases. And so when they add a new feature to one, they re-implement it four or five times to add that same new feature elsewhere. They want their features to be consistent, to look the same across all platforms. So they've been looking for mechanisms by which they could do that more efficiently. So what they've done is they've used React Native as they're implementing new things here in Word. This is the uh, comment pane so that you can see what comments are in Word. They've implemented that using React Native and then sharing assets on React so that they can now very efficiently build out this new experience across all of their endpoints and including sharing assets with their web properties. The nice thing about using something like React Native or Xamarin Forms is that it's just using the native platform behind the scenes. So their scroll bars, their buttons, uh, accessibility, how tabbing works, it all works the same. It doesn't feel like an island of different technology within their application, and they can now build that out really efficiently. So you know, why, why might you care about this at all? Well, if, again, if you're a C Sharp or .NET developer, this, you probably are gonna use something like Xamarin or Xamarin Forms if you're going cross-platform. But if you're a web developer or have web developers and you wanna build native applications cross-platform and or share assets between your desktop application and your web application, this might be something that is a good option for you. If you're interested in uh, more about React Native, there's a session at 12.30 today given by Paul Gus Marino, who was here, who may have stepped out because oh, he's way in the back. <laughs> he's going to be here with him and Kiki are giving a session at 1230 where they're going to talk in much more detail and romance it much more than I will. Um, so if you're interested, please go to that. And now moving on to, uh, we're going to switch gears yet again. We've talked about some of the big rocks that we've been working on, uh, XAML Islands and decoupling the presentation in WinUI 3.0. Now we're gonna bubble back up again. We're also doing a bunch of feature work across the platform, across WinUI, and we wanted to share with you some of the feature work that we're doing that is either actively shipping or will be shipping shortly across the platform. Yeah, so we're gonna run through a bunch of new controls and UI platform features that are being added pretty quickly, but they're all things that you can learn more about from either samples or by stopping by the Windows UI booth later. So. First of all, there's a bunch of control updates that shipped with WinUI 2.1 a few weeks ago. One of these additions was the items repeater. This allows you to build collection controls that have much more flexible layout options than the existing grid and list view. They also support, for, the items repeater also supports virtualization and is much more performant for large collections than your existing controls. Another new control that was added is the teaching tip. This allows you to provide contextually relevant information to a user on the first run experience, either the first time they run your application or right after an update if you want to call attention to a new feature that you've just added. Theme Shadow is another addition that came with WinUI 2.1. This is something we talked a little bit about at Build last year in terms of how depth is going to be brought to the Fluent design system. But this is essentially creating scene-based shadows based on the Z order of your UI elements. This means that you can draw attention to the highest Z order item or you know, by setting a Z offset. And some of our new controls or existing controls like um, the teaching tip that I just showed actually use this by default to really draw attention to the highest item in your visual hierarchy. Compact density is another addition in WinUI. This allows you to, on average, portray 33% more UI in the same amount of screen real estate. This means that if you have kind of a mouse and keyboard driven experience and don't need the larger touch targets that you get by default, you can condense your UI and fit a lot more information in the same amount of screen space. Animated Visual Player, I talked a bit about earlier when I demoed Lottie, but this is the XAML control that allows you to play these animated visual scenes in your UI. Radio Menu Flyout is the ability to add radio buttons to your menu bar. This means that if you have mutually exclusive options that you want to insert there, you have the ability to easily do this and portray to the user that that's what you're doing. So, well, one thing sir, yeah. that I do want to mention about WinUI 2.1 is that it is shipping today. 
the new capabilities that we are doing in WinUI 2.1 are available primarily just in WinUI. So a lot of those new controls that Lindsay just showed, if you want to use them, they're no longer in the platform, they're in WinUI, and all of our new development is going to be done in WinUI. So just want to make that, that clear that if you are looking for those inbox windows, you aren't going to find them, you'll have to get them in from WinUI. Yeah, and the link that I provided earlier, and we'll show it again at the end, is where you can go online to see all that on GitHub. So in addition to the controls that shipped with WinUI 2.1, there are a bunch of in-progress controls that are going to ship earlier than WinUI 3.0. So these are places where they're actively being developed and is actually the perfect opportunity for you to provide your feedback online. So one of these new controls is the new tabs control. This is for places where you have UI where you want a bunch of documents or pages that you want users to be able to rearrange or close out. And you actually shared with me that there's an inbox customer that people are pretty excited about using this. Yes, the new terminal is leveraging the tabs control. Yeah. So so this is uh, actually a place where the Windows Community Toolkit built a version of this control. But since the um, new terminal is a C++ app, we wanted to build a C++ version of this control so that they didn't need to take a dependency on the managed runtime. So pretty exciting. And also something that went from a community-driven control in the Community Toolkit to something that's shipping in WinUI now, or will be soon. And the link down there is where you can provide feedback on either the spec or API shape. Another addition is radio button grouping. This allows you to group radio buttons together without a stack panel, which means that they're a lot more natural to navigate with either the keyboard or accessibility tools. Scroll Viewer is another kind of big investment that has been being basically re-architected in WinUI. The original Scroll Viewer solved a lot of kind of typical scrolling use case as well, but we've gotten a lot of feedback that it wasn't flexible enough. And so there's been a long process to sort of figure out the right layered pay-for-play version of scrolling where you still can solve your simple scenarios easily, but if you have something with maybe a custom rendered image with a bunch of business logic that you couldn't previously integrate with the scroll viewer, now you'll be able to use an inbox scrolling control rather than writing a custom solution. Lastly, there's number box, which is a kind of addition of, from an input validation point of view, but it's also just the ability to have a number specific text field that also handles things like currency, this one's also kind of cool because it was actually a proposal that was put on our backlog by the community, and we've picked it up and started building it inside the uh, Windows team. So kind of a good example of something that went from an external request to pretty quickly being something we're going to support in the platform. So like Joe mentioned earlier, some of these are available today. You can go download them right now, and others are in development, and you have access to them either in preview builds or soon after. Another control we want to talk a bit about is the new web view. Some of you who went to talks yesterday may have heard that uh, Microsoft Edge is moving over to be based on Chromium to get better web compatibility and other improvements. We want to bring these same improvements to your application via the web view. So there's actually a preview version of Win32, avail Win32 web view available today. And this is a version of the web view that will be based on that same Chromium backed version of Microsoft Edge. There's also a UWP version of this control that will be coming with WinUI 3.0. By default, these web views will be always up to date, meaning that they're aligned with the version of the browser that's shipping on your actual machine. But we know compatibility is important to a lot of people, so we're also working on a bring your own version of these controls. This will allow you to lock to a particular version of the browser inside your app and make sure that your web view will ship with that version. Beyond both of these, you'll still be able to use the existing web view if you're using it today. These are just options we're adding to the platform for those of you who want to take advantage of the new web capabilities that we're investing in and get the most modern version of the web on Windows. Beyond some of the new controls, there's also some features we're adding to inbox windows. As we mentioned before, a lot of these are on our roadmap for WinUI 3.0, but they're shipping in the, uh, in the actual version of the operating system first. So these are things that you'll see in 1903 or the May 2019 update that you're all now getting access to. One of the big things that was added here for UWP developers is new windowing capabilities. With the addition of App Window, UWP developers can now size and position multiple top-level windows for their UWP application. In addition, there's a task manager that will pop up in a second, and the reason that's there is to show you that all of these windows are actually running on the same thread. This provides a lot of performance improvements, as well as simplified app logic where you don't need to kind of consider 
keeping a bunch of different things in sync across different core windows. So this is something we're pretty excited about, and we're continuing to evolve both with new capabilities and figuring out how we merge the UWP and Win32 windowing stories. So something to go check out today. We also are adding a few things to the visual layer or the composition system. I mentioned 3D already, but calling it out again here, there's some additional primitives that are being added around scene management and 3D content to the actual inbox version of Windows, and there will be helper controls that ship with WinUI to make loading this content as easy as possible for you. In the visual layer, we've added a lot of animations and effects over the years, and our latest addition is the Composition Radial Gradient Brush. You can build animated radial gradient experiences, and they'll integrate with the rest of your composition effect and animation pipelines. We're also in the process of adding particle support, which allows you to build these really rich visual scenes with a lot of motion and interactivity and these physics-based behaviors. So there's a spectrum of these features and they're shipping in different mechanisms. Some are available in Box in 1903, some are available to insiders, particularly particles, if you wanna check those out. And then in one of the version, earlier versions of WinUI 2.x, you'll get some of the helper controls for 3D consumption. But as I mentioned, these are also all on the WinUI roadmap. Some of them will be able to come sooner because they're easier for us to decouple from the operating system. The full set of composition capabilities, so all of the primitives that currently power the Fluent Design System, will all be part of the WinUI 3.0 update. And then there are some areas like windowing where we know they're on our roadmap and we wanna bring you the same benefits of decoupling that we have with everything else but they're a little more tightly coupled with the operating system, so it'll take a little longer to get there. So with that, we're gonna cover some other additional talks and concepts you may find so, interesting. So yeah, as we're working towards wrap up here with three minutes to go, two other topics that are worthy of themselves, their own topics or multiple topics is .NET. And if you saw the .NET roadmap yesterday by Scott and Scott, they talked about this a bit, but we just did wanna mention that WPF and Windows Forms are on track to be released to be supported on .NET Core 3.0 in September this year. They'll be open sourced at that time. And that in addition, there'll be a .NET Core 3.1 release in November, and that'll be the supported release. So if you want a supported version of WPF and Windows Forms on .NET Core 3, then there'll be a release in November for that. There's a roadmap for .NET 5. If you're interested in more details on .NET, there's a session that already happened. So the uh, first one, the Scott Hanselman, Scott Hunter one, happened yesterday, but if you haven't seen it, you can watch it on demand. They talk about the full roadmap for .NET. And there's another one this afternoon that talks about building uh, .NET desktop applications uh, using .NET Core. The other thing I wanna mention is we still, Fluent Design is our design system for how we build our controls. It's what allows us to build controls that work well with touch and mouse and keyboard, uh, that are fluent in, in uh, design principles in general. Um, the fluent design system is something we are still actively working on and evolving. And in fact, we're expanding the role of fluent design to include Android, iOS, and the web. And if you're interested in more information on fluent design and up tomorrow morning at 8.30, which all of you in this room no doubt will be up tomorrow morning at 8.30 because you're up today at 8.30, <laughs> then I would encourage this talk uh, by Chigusa and Peter. And with that, as we get into more resources, the one thing I just wanna, uh, if you will, a call to action is that the one thing that uh, we are trying to do is we're trying to move all of our inertia, momentum, everything towards WinUI and WinUI 3.0. So if there is a call to action is please engage in WinUI 3.0. If you're building a UWP application today and you're not using WinUI, we'd encourage you to use it. If for some reason it doesn't work for you, please give us feedback because this is where we're moving all our presentation platform uh, momentum in the future will be in WinUI 3.0. Yeah, so there's a couple different resources. Like Joe mentioned, the open source project for WinUI is a great place to engage with us. But there's also a couple other open source projects we've mentioned today. Lottie for Windows, which I demoed briefly both down level and mentioned in the kind of new update section, is an open source project that you can contribute to as well. And the Windows Community Toolkit, which is where the XAML host controls live, as well as many other community-driven controls. There's also a bunch of samples for each XAML composition and windowing, so make sure to check those out if anything you saw today was interesting to you. And in addition, always make sure to follow us on Twitter, at Windows UI, for the latest updates. 
and we've got 12, 11, <laughs> 10, 9, 8. So we value your feedback. Please enter at five, 4. Thank you. <laughs> 3, 2, 1. Thank you. Thank you.